And Frank is going to introduce our next speaker giving testimony. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Bruce, very much. Our next uh, testifier is David Vine. He's a professor of political anthropology at American University, in Washington, D.C. And he's the author of a newly released book titled The United States of War, a global history of America's endless conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic State. David is also the author of the books Islands of Shame and Base Nation. And I'll just say, I found out about David when I heard him on Democracy Now! with Amy Gibbon sometime in the last year. And I looked him up and we've been communicating and I got his book and I'm glad to present him today. David, you're on. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you to everyone who has helped put on this amazing Cold War Truth Commission. Um, thank you especially to Rachel as well and to Code Pink. Of course, this is especially appropriate uh, being held the week of the 18th anniversary of the US invasion and war in Iraq. Uh, I, I have learned so much already. And I, I must say my commitment to my students and reading their papers is gonna be severely tested tonight um, as I debate between wanting to watch more and, and, and working on, on, on their work. I, I should say the, the truth is getting out. I hope if you didn't see the front page of the USA Today in just a few weeks ago, a reckoning is near. America has a vast overseas military empire. Does it still need it? This is the USA Today, the nation's newspaper. A reckoning is near. There's little I can say that hasn't been said already. Miguel Angel at the beginning, Rachel Frank, Gerald Horn, Carly Town, and many, many others have already shown us that there was nothing cold about the Cold War. If we just look at the deaths of the cold, so-called Cold War alone, among many other forms of destruction, I think we have to ask, how can we call this war cold, given that it killed three to four million people in Korea, an estimated 3.8 million in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, half a million in a US-backed genocide in Indonesia, around a million in Afghanistan in the 1980s, 50,000 in Nicaragua, 75,000 in El Salvador, 200,000 in the Guatemalan genocide, among many others that I sadly don't have time to name. Calling the Cold War cold, of course, is so deeply troubling because it contributes to ignoring the many victims of the not Cold War, the dead, as well as the injured, the displaced, the traumatized, including victims here in the United States. I, just as a uh, quick aside, I, well, I don't think language choices are our most important political priority. I think we should continually call attention to the off offensive, really offensive inaccuracy of the name Cold War, and at least consider pushing uh, for, the, for a renaming of the war in the media and in history textbooks, among other places. Using the term so-called Cold War, I think is a good start. For now, I'll use the term the not Cold War. The main thing I wanna say today, echoing again what others have already said so powerfully, is that among the tens of millions of victims of the not Cold War, we should count the six Asian women, Asian American women, and two others murdered in last week's racist, misogynist, massacre in Atlanta. Why should we consider them among the victims of the Cold War, the not Cold War? Because racism, of course, has fueled much of the US-led violence during and since the not Cold War in ways that in turn have further fueled racism, which in turn has fueled further war and violence to this day, including the massacre and for that matter, the January 6th coup attempt in Washington, DC perhaps put more simply and hopefully more clearly, racism has fueled US wars and other violence, which has fueled racism, which has fueled US wars and violence, which has fueled racism and so on in a repeating cycle. In a March 19th article in The Nation, I'll put a link in the chat shortly, Christine on Terry Park and Kathleen Richards show us the connections between rising anti-Asian violence across the country and quote, a long history of US foreign policy in Asia centered on domination 
and violence fueled by racism, unquote. I'm gonna quote from them at length because I think they demonstrate and explain these connections far better than I can. Belittling and dehumanizing Asians has helped justify endless wars and the expansion of US militarism. Christine Ahn, Terry Park and Kathleen Richards write, and this has deadly consequences for Asians and Asian Americans, especially women. Anti-Asian violence through US foreign policy has manifested in the wars that have killed millions, torn families apart and led to massive displacement in the nuclear tests and chemical weapons storage that resulted in environmental contamination in Okinawa, Guam and the Marshall Islands and beyond in the widespread use of napalm and Agent Orange in Vietnam, Laos and Korea in the US military bases that have destroyed villages and entire communities in the violence perpetrated by US soldiers on Asian women's bodies. They continue, if we are to successfully stop anti-Asian hatred here in the United States, we must recognize how US foreign policy perpetuates it and end US militarism and wars throughout Asia Pacific. As we address violence against Asians and women and dismantle white supremacy at home, they say, we must also fundamentally re reorient US foreign policy in the Asia Pacific region and I'd add worldwide, away from domination and control and toward true human security for all. Building on the words of Christine Ahn, Terry Park and Kathleen Richards, let me close by saying that I hope today's event and last week's hor really horrific massacre inspire us to demand with new urgency this kind of fundamental transformation of US foreign policy. Demanding such change is not only the right and moral thing to do, it may be the only thing that saves us. Without such a transformation, the United States will likely continue to lurch from one racist war to the next, one white supremacist attack to the next, abroad and at home. As the nation's newspaper has said, and as last week's massacre demands, a reckoning is near. We must make it so. Thank you. Thank you, David. Frank? Thank you, David. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'd like to have you as a professor. 